Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ARA's Webinar Wednesday program. I'm Jerry DiMaggio. I'll be serving as moderator for today's webinar, which is entitled Innovation Deployment, Strategies and Building Blocks to Adopt Innovations. Next slide, please. I'd like to first cover a few uh, housekeeping items with, with you. Then I'll turn the program over to our presenter. And then at the conclusion of today's one hour program, we'll have approximately a 15 minute Q&A period. So first of all, uh, if you're experiencing an issue with sound and you're using your computer speakers, please disconnect from your computer speakers. Please dial in then using your phone. If you continue to have another sound related issue, please use the chat button and send the message only to the host and we'll do our very best to assist you. Next slide, please. If you have any questions and certainly throughout the program, we encourage you to ask questions. We'll be, uh, we'll be deferring questions uh, until the conclusion of the technical program. As shown on this slide, click on the Q&A button and send your question and listen carefully. Please direct your question to both the host and the panelists that will be most helpful to us. We'll address these questions directly at the conclusion of the presentation. Next slide, please. Finally, with regard to housekeeping, to view the presentation of full screen mode as shown on this slide, at the top of your webinar settings, click on the down arrow, highlight the view, and then choose fit the viewer. Just as a reminder, to receive the one hour PDH certificate, you must attend the entire one hour full webinar program. I'll address this further at the conclusion of today's presentation. Next slide, please. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Bill Vavrick is a vice president, principal engineer, and manager at ARA's transportation and infrastructure sector. He joined ARA in 2000 and has been responsible for a diverse portfolio of projects, including projects in transportation engineering, transportation research, and today's topic, technology deployment. He's been conducting since 2000 research for state DOTs, local transportation agencies, and at the national level for a number of federal organizations. Dr. Vavrick, germane to today's topic, is currently the program manager for ARA support of FHWA's Innovation Deployment Program, where he assists states and local agencies to implement innovative technology. And now it's my great pleasure to turn today's program over to my colleague and very good friend, Dr. Bill Vavrick. Bill? Thank you, Jerry. Really appreciate that, uh, that introduction. And thank you to all of you who are uh, joining us for, for today's presentation. I'm really excited today to talk to you about a topic uh, that, that's really been a good part of the, the, the last 20 years or so of my career, which is innovation. And, uh, and I'm bringing this to you from ARA's Webinar Wednesday series. And, and ARA as a company you know, is an amazing, innovative place to work. Uh, many of the things that I'm going to talk about today come about because of what I've learned as part of being an ARA engineer and supporting awesome, innovative organizations like the Federal Highway Administration, like a number of state DOTs, tollways, turnpikes, and other agencies. So what we're going to cover today is a bit about what innovation is and, and why it's hard to implement. And then I want to give you specifically five strategies for you to be a successful innovator. I also then want to build on that by giving you five building blocks for an innovative organization, right? We all work in organizations and, and as part of those organizations, we want to provide that next level of success. And that is bringing innovation to the work that we do. So we're going to talk about building blocks of an innovative organization. So let's jump right in. Innovation is what happens when people have new ideas. When they move beyond the current way of solving a problem to a new way. 
when they discover new ways to connect the dots in their work. That new way of working that allows us to get things done faster, cheaper, and better than how we do things today, innovation is that new idea. To implement innovation, though, it requires change. Let me say that again. It requires change. In order to be cheaper, faster, or better than how you're doing things today, you need to do things differently than you're doing them today. We must change to innovate. And change adopts innovation. To be an innovator, to have an innovative group, to have an innovative department, it requires that we be the change, that we be the change that embraces innovation. For too long, the idea of innovation is that, oh, that's somebody else's job. We've got a department that focuses on innovation or the industry we work in, the industry will do the innovative stuff because they're driven by this faster, cheaper, better, uh, you know, these, these things that want to make us accelerate. So let's rely on industry. You know, innovation will be that competitive advantage that industry needs to, to move us on to the next project. So if we just sit back, somebody will help do it for us. And all too often, we've not focused on innovation, but we've focused on change. And we worry about change. However, we can be the change that leads to innovation. This cartoon reminds me of what I often see from engineers and scientists when we discuss the change that's needed to be innovative. We say yes to the innovation, but we say no to change. But remember, we can be the change that leads to innovation in our industry. So to innovate requires change, and most of us often resist change. The resistance can really lead to struggles within ourselves, within our teams, and within an effective organization. You know, there's an old adage that says, resist change and die, accept change and survive, cause change and lead, lead change and thrive. We all want to thrive in our work. We want to do work that's personally rewarding. Leading change toward innovation is a surefire way to thrive in your work. Leading change toward innovation will bring great personal satisfaction in the work that you do every day. There are many pieces in an innovative organization. Those pieces all come together differently for each different organization. But for every organization, innovation does start with the right mindset. The unexpected must be expected. And that mindset should permeate every level of the organization. In a, in a non-innovative environment, people might say things like, well, we want new ideas, but I'm paid to do my current job. Or, yeah, we're doing fine. Let's let our existing work continue before we try something new. Or you might hear something like, you know, people are going to get cynical about all these change initiatives. If you sense that an innovation mindset does not exist in all the pieces of your organization, you can make a difference. You can work to influence your colleagues at your level of the organization. And you can directly ensure that the pieces of the organization that report to you or that you have influence over, that you can influence them adopting that innovation mindset. So culture, mindset is really the name of the game. You can influence the culture of your organization. I remember when I was first getting started as a young engineer, I heard from a DOT executive uh, many years ago, and, and he said, Bill, I want you to know that our organization will always crawl before we walk and will walk before we run. And, and this was the culture 
of, of that organization. So does that mean that innovation doesn't work there? Is that a mindset that wouldn't allow innovation? Well, some might say it would stifle innovation. And if you can't change mindset, at least a little bit, it's gonna be hard to change the speed at which you get new results. Sometimes you need to be willing to crawl and walk and run in, in quite a bit of short amount of time because we want to be running. We want to see new results. So if you want new results, you have to have a new mindset. People think, well, why do I need new mindset? Why do I need to have a growth mindset if I want new results? Well, quite frankly, if you aren't growing, you're dying. It's really hard to stay steady state. So if you aren't actively working on improving yourself, improving your mindset, it's likely that your mindset is slowly worsening without you even realizing it. You wake up one day and you wonder, what happened to all the success you once had? Well, it could be that you lost the mindset. You had it, but you didn't continue to develop it, and it can shrink. That mindset is what leads to new results. Now, the engineers and scientists who work in the transportation industry tend to be a bit more left-brained, right? They tend to be more logic, more reasoning, more measurement, or computation. In this way of thinking, the world is a math problem or a science problem. There is a solution. I just need to come up with the solution, right? I'm trying to optimize. But to innovate, to really go to the next level, to adopt the new thing that's going to catapult your group, your company, your industry, your agency to the next level, we need to be whole brain thinkers. We need to understand the context and the emotions. We need to be creative and imaginative to develop innovation and to deploy that innovation through change. If we're too analytical and we're too rigid, if we're not whole brain thinkers, you can really struggle with innovation. It can be tough. This cartoon is, is classic for the engineer that's being asked to innovate, right? It says, I'd be happy to give you innovative thinking. What are the guidelines? We want the rules. We want the box that we're going to operate inside. We want to know where our silo is. But if we really want to be innovative, we need to be whole brain thinkers and whole brain innovators. We need to not worry as much about the guidelines and focus on the innovation. Now, there are many organizations, transportation organizations that I've worked with that I've been a part of, that have organizational silos that separate us, right? And we tend to concern ourselves only with the things in our silo. And often we'll want to make life better for those things in our silo. We want to optimize. We want to process and execute as well as we can within our silo. But is that really what makes an innovative organization? an innovative agency, I think we can do better than staying within our silos. These silos of excellence, which many engineers, you know, put up these silos of excellence to do the best possible work that's out there, may not make your organization as effective as it could be. Effectiveness is about how all the pieces and parts come together and work together. And there are many, many pieces and parts that have to come together to make innovation work. Innovative enterprises build teams that morph and change to meet the challenges and the opportunities that are in front of them. They build teams that morph as a new process comes out and new ideas unfold. We can bring new gears in. We can make the machine that is our organization better and better. The mindset changes. The team gets focused on a larger goal. New results come about. We become an innovative organization because we know how to put all the pieces and parts together to be effective. 
So let's look at some key things that innovative people and innovative organizations can consider that they can consistently do. The first one, the first big thing that you can do, that your organization can do to be more innovative is to listen. Listen to the members of your internal team. Listen to other members of the organization. Maybe they're in other parts of those silos, other silos within your organization. Listen to your industry and the work that's going on in the industry. Listen to your peers. Listen to that external community, the community of customers that you're serving. Listen particularly to your customers. If you want to be innovative, you need to listen. Many of the people around you, above you, beside you, your customers, your direct reports, they have tremendous insights and ideas that will help lead to innovation, to doing things better, faster, with less cost, to being more effective. So no, item number one that we can all do, we can all listen. The next one is to stay open. Heaven forbid we, we listen, but we're not open to the information that we're getting. Remember when I said to listen, it was all around you. Your team, the stakeholders, the customers, the bosses, everyone around you, we need to listen. But we also need to stay open for where the ideas are coming from. Ideas don't always come from the experts. It isn't always the person with the most initials after their name that has the best idea. Talk to the novices. Talk to the new people. Check out what's going on with those, those backroom tinkerers that are always tinkering with something. Talk to them, stay open to what they're doing, to what they, what they see. Convert that off the wall idea that you learned around the water cooler at the office, or hopefully we're getting back to having more water cooler conversations in the office. Convert that off the wall, the idea, into an innovation, into something that propels your organization to move forward. So we're gonna listen and we're gonna stay open. But if we truly want to innovate, we need to collaborate. It is really, really difficult to innovate all on your own. So when I say collaborate, we need to collaborate across groups. We need to collaborate with other agencies. We need to collaborate with universities and, and the students, the faculty, the researchers. We need to collaborate within our industry, our peers that are do, have, facing many of the same problems. We need to look for new perspectives and new ideas so that we can develop our innovation process. Now, the interesting thing about collaboration, it cannot be done alone. It requires patience. It requires focus. It requires regular and action-oriented communication. Again, we can't do it alone. So we have to get multiple people together and we have to communicate. And communicating is about the listener. It's about what folks are hearing and how they can communicate to bring that collaboration forward. Collaboration allows you to play to your strengths. I happen to be a big picture person, and while I know how to do all the details, the details are not where I find my energy. It's not where I you know, always am at my best. So if I can have others that I collaborate with who love to be down in the weeds and taking care of every little detail, that collaboration plays to our strengths and allows us as a group to be more effective, to be more innovative. And collaboration offers a learning opportunity, right? Now, collaboration, especially for a lot of engineers and scientists, it's not always our default setting. But you can be the initiator of collaboration. 
You can change your mindset to focus on doing things better, on innovating. So we're going to listen. We're going to stay open. We know that we need to collaborate. Next, we want to go flat. Now, not everyone on this call has the ability to rewrite the org chart of their organization. And quite frankly, I'm not asking you to rewrite your org charts. I'm asking you to think about how you move forward in, in bringing innovative ideas to the front to make them happen. The flatter you have a structure of your innovation group, the easier it is to move things forward. Flat structures shorten the approval process. Flat structures don't have lines of communication or silos of excellence that impede innovation, right? Flat allows you to work across an enterprise. You may not be able to change the org chart, but what you can do is empower your colleagues. You can empower your direct, direct reports, empower your team to act independently, create a safe environment where people can innovate, where it's okay for them to try things. Going flat in your organizational thinking, in your organizational uh, opportunities will allow people to have a safe environment for innovation. So we're going to listen, we're going to stay open, we're going to collaborate, we're going to go flat in our innovation structure. And the last thing, and oh boy, is this a tough one for engineers. We're going to embrace failure. Now, the very first failure that you see on the chart in front of you is the spelling of the word, word failure. I did this on purpose. I did this to demonstrate that every detail does not need to be perfect in order for you to have some success. Many of the greatest innovations in our world were unintended results created by accidents. Now my spelling could have been unintentional because I'm not a very good speller, but quite frankly, this time it was intentional to allow that failure to be on the screen The accidents that are out there have really led to some awesome innovations. The microwave oven was a self-taught engineer doing military research on improvements to radar systems who happened to have in his pocket a peanut cluster bar. And when he exposed the microwaves uh, from the radar system, the, that bar melted. When he exposed popcorns to those microwaves, they popped. When he exposed a whole egg, the egg exploded. We, he created what I used this morning to warm up my breakfast. In 1941, an electrical engineer had an inspiration for a hook and loop fastener while he was out on a hunting trip in the Alps with his dog, right? He noticed that these burrs, these tiny seeds covered in hundreds of microscopic hooks would latch on to the natural loops in his dog's fur. Those hooks and loops are Velcro. An accident that led to an innovation, right? Penicillin, an awesome medication that we take was an accident. A scientist was going on vacation left bacteria in the Petri dish. Cleaning up the lab when he gets back from vacation, he gets to the dish that had one of the, the staff uh, viruses or uh, bacteria in it, and something really odd caught his eye. Right? This dish was colored in, covered in colonies of bacteria, except the one where there was mold growing. And around the mold, there was an area that was totally free of bacteria. It was as if the mold had blocked the bacteria from spreading. That accident, that leaving your dishes out when you go on vacation was used to create a drug that keeps us all working and, and keeps us healthy. 
post-it notes. You know, when you're done with a post-it note, you throw it in the wastebasket, right? Well, that was pretty much what the inventor almost did when he developed this super strong adhesive for 3M back in 1968. He thought he was trying to get this super strong adhesive, but what did he invent? Something that stuck to objects and could easily be lifted off. It was an accident. Those folks, those innovators, those inventors were embracing the failures that they had. And that's not easy to do because our comfort zone is, is not where we're embracing failure. But getting outside of your comfort zone, that's where the magic happens. All right? You have folks like Henry, Henry Ford, a father in our transportation industry, right? Failure is the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. We have great folks like Winston Churchill, success, walking from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Sometimes failure can be hard. You know, making a mistake, it can be tough. But you've got to keep going. You've got to keep trying. You've got to have that mindset that you can be better. And that will help you to be better. I grew up watching Michael Jordan play basketball on TV, right? Missed more than 9,000 shots. 26 times was trusted with that game-winning shot, that buzzer beater. He failed over and over and over again. And that's why he succeeds, right? Failure is, we can, we can do, we can win through our failures. There is an opportunity there. A number of years ago, I was, I was sitting at the, at the Transportation Research Board annual meeting with a, with a great group of leaders of, of state DOTs. And Pete Ron, the Secretary of Transportation for Maryland, uh, was, was giving, uh, was one of the panelists in this uh, session and he said you know we're talking about innovation and pete said it's better to have a nine and one record than a one and oh record and boy i scribbled that down about as fast as i could when i saw it it's better to be nine and one than one and oh and i think of so many times where i, I just want to do it i want to make sure that what i do is not a failure i want to make sure that it works i want to make sure that it's perfect and what we do is we then only concentrate on that one thing that we can do to make sure that it doesn't fail. But what would have happened if we would have tried to do 10 things, nine of them being successful, one of them maybe not so much, we end up with nine innovations. And we can do that. We'll talk more about it here in a moment. So I've talked about strategy, listen, stay open, collaborate, go flat and embrace failure. Now let's talk about the building blocks of innovation. How do we build that up? Well, the first building block to innovation is leadership, right? Leadership, and it doesn't matter, it, this isn't the top leader of your organization. This, is, this can be you, this can be you and your colleagues, right? But you need to make a commitment as a leader to being innovative. We have to do something that not every engineer does incredibly well, and that's letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Everything doesn't have to be perfect before it gets implemented, right? When you're innovative as a leader, you're always, remember you're listening, you're collaborating, you're staying open. When you're staying open and you're talking to people, you're hearing those bottoms up ideas. Folks who are in the trenches bringing you new opportunities. Leadership paying attention to those, challenging your team to do more, to do better, right? Winning over the workforce. That's how as you can lead in innovation. You need to make a commitment to it because you need to make a commitment to that changed mindset, to always sharpening the saw, to getting better at what you do. That will allow you to be a leader and an innovator. But it's not all about the leaders. One of the other key building blocks is empowerment. You, we need to empower all of the people that we work with, our team, to be innovative. 
We need to allow folks to champion things and to foster those champions, to encourage teamwork. Remember, it takes collaboration. We want to break down those silos, or if, if we can't break them all the way down, maybe we can poke some holes in the side, put a window in the side of your silo, and maybe your neighbor in the other silo will put a window in their silo, and you can talk through those windows. You can collaborate. You can work as a team across the silos. Empowerment also allows you to have a little bit of competition, and healthy competition is exciting. It drives results. As humans, we love to compete. We love to compete with each other to be better, to do more. So that healthy competition can drive results. And we also want to empower our team, our innovations, to fail fast. If you're going to fail, fail fast, right? Don't, don't put too much effort into something that isn't going anywhere. Know when to keep going and know when it's time to say, oh, let's gather the team back together. Maybe we can go a different direction. If you're going to fail, fail fast. <clears throat> so we talked about leadership and empowerment. Now communication. And communication is a key to success in innovative organizations. But communication is not something that most engineers do incredibly well. Communication builds awareness. It builds a foundation for that collaboration. It builds a foundation for us to communicate with others, with all the stakeholders, and to listen. What are the needs? What can we do better? Where can we go? Communicating to that stakeholders can come in a number of different ways. You want to tell the story of, of the innovations that you're doing. And you might do that through newsletters or social media through email blasts or magazine articles or YouTube videos, whatever the message is, as an innovative organization, communicating to your stakeholders about the innovations that you're implementing, about the innovations that you're considering, about how they can do whatever their job is, better, faster, and at a lower cost how they can work across the organization to get things done. You want to communicate to accelerate innovation. Now, there, there's a number of different types of exchanges, workshops, meetings, conferences that you can use to really accelerate the deployment of innovation. Getting people together, allowing them to collaborate, allowing them to listen and to stay open and talk with others, allowing them to understand how they can move forward, that is a key to the success of an innovative organization. The other thing that's incredibly important is recognition. Again, another thing that as engineers and scientists, we don't always do that well. Recognition of the people who are bringing the ideas. That backroom tinkerer we talked about that had a really good idea that you listened to, you stayed open, then we realized we could collaborate with some other people and, and really make something out of that backroom tinkering that they were doing, celebrate that. If you can give an award, make it an award. It might just be an attaboy, a hearty handshake, a pat on the back, the warm glow of victory, something that promotes those innovators. Show your organization, show your industry, show your bosses that you're innovating, that your team is a team of innovators, and that you can implement those innovative ideas, and that you will lead in that implementation. That recognition of the people who are doing well allows them to feel a sense of pride about the great things that they're doing. And they want to do something more, and they want the next innovation. But also celebrate the people who are in implementing those innovations. Celebrate how they're doing things in a new way. Promote that. Help, them, help promote those individuals as people and promote their ideas and their innovations so that the innovative organization moves forward. And the last of the building blocks is measurement. We need to track how we're doing. 
if you don't have measurements of your performance in your job, probably those things that are on your performance review, whatever it is that you get in your goals from your supervisor or your boss's boss or, or the highest levels of the organization, those things that people measure are the key indicators of what they want you to do and to do better. So we want to track those performance indicators. Maybe how much something costs or how much time it takes or how satisfied the customers are when we've implemented this new idea. Now you might be thinking, well, Bill, my innovation is, is in you know, the way that we're designing a bridge. So does the customer really care that I'm doing this better? Well, yes, they do, because that customer is, wants to drive on that bridge. And they want to know that we're building that bridge to last a long time and that we're building that bridge at, at a, the lowest cost that we can that provides a really long life, right? But we need to track those performance indicators. And we need to make that part of our communication. We also need to track and understand where the new ideas are coming from. It will allow you as a leader within innovation or as an innovative group or an innovative part of your company to know where to go to the well to get the next idea. So track and understand where these new ideas are coming for, where they're coming from, and, and who the people are that are putting them forward. And again, report on how you're doing against those measurements. Right? You can't manage what you don't measure. So we need to make measurements. So we need to make report on those measurements. Report out to the entire team. If we're collaborating, if we're innovating, the ideas are coming from the entire team. We need to report back to them. Remember what we talked about in the communication, report back to folks how things are going, how we're doing against those key performance indicators. So if you remember, we had five strategies, listen, staying open, collaborate, go flat, embrace failure. That led to the building blocks. Some of these organizational building blocks, program related building blocks, right? Showing leadership, empowering people, communicating, recognizing the successes and the, and the innovation and measuring, right? Those strategies leading to the building blocks allow us to innovate. Early in the presentation, I gave you a number of things that happened a long, long time ago as innovations that came from failures, right? Things like the dirty dishes that led to mold growing in the Petri dish and penicillin. But innovation is not something of times gone by. Innovation is happening every day in all sorts of different agents, industries, in all different ways. Let's take a look at just a handful of innovations of the last 25 years in technology, in healthcare, and in transportation. The Internet of Things. Well, heck, 25 years ago, the, the Internet wasn't even hardly a thing. Yesterday, I got a, a call from my wife who said there was somebody from the gas company who was at our house could I turn the furnace off in our house so the gas company could do some work on the meter? Why did my wife call me to ask me to do that? Because there's an app on my phone that connects to the internet and that internet of things is tied to the thermostat in my house and that app allows me to change the controls on my thermostat. A thermostat that in my office or in many, you know, certainly in the home that I grew up in was nothing more than a thermometer and a dial, right? As to where we wanted the, a mechanical switch to get hit. Now the internet of things allows us to control the temperature in our home. It allows machines to communicate with one another. It allows, you know, our vehicles to, to self-diagnose. It's a bit cold here in the Midwest right now that we had zero temperature on my drive to work this morning. And, it, and my truck told me that my tire pressure in the right rear tire was lower than the other three tires. That is kind of part of the internet of things because not only did it tell me that on the dashboard, it told me that in an app. 
It's incredible how the Internet of Things is changing and promoting innovation in all different ways. The blockchain. The blockchain is relatively new. It used to be that data was stored in databases, and there was one place to go to have that ledger of the transactions. Now we have this thing called blockchain. It's what a lot of the cryptocurrencies are based on. But it's also used in medical records, and, and heck, next thing you know, we're going to be, you know, the blockchain will be tied into the construction of infrastructure process, right? Blockchains are distributed ledgers. It's not centralized. It makes it nearly impossible to change or to hack or to cheat the system. That's pretty awesome, right? That is an innovation that's come about recently. And that record of transactions that's maintained across multiple computers on a peer-to-peer -peer network makes it really solid for, for knowing what's going on and, and not hackable, not, not able to be cheated or, or stolen from, right? Where somebody could go in and make a, a database entry change. To, to make something look better. An amazing innovation of, of recent times. You know, as we're, as we're uh, in the middle, I guess, starting year two of, of living with the coronavirus, we've learned about some awesome technologies that have come about and come about quite quickly. Messenger RNA, mRNA, right? That's, that's it's, the messenger RNA is necessary for protein production and, and that protein production and that technology is behind several of the current COVID vaccines and treatments. So we introduced this messenger RNA into our bodies and our bodies then put up some protein. It provides a blueprint for our cells to produce a, a protein that keeps us protected from the virus, right? It allows us to produce antibodies and to fight against that infection. That's a relatively new innovation, a new technology that is now massively deployed. Many of the folks on this call have, have had injections and, re you know, as part of our COVID vaccines that are messenger RNA technology. A number of years ago, I went in, I had uh, a Glasses, I wore glasses and contact lenses, and I realized that there was a way to make corrections. It wasn't that long ago that the idea of correcting your vision with LASIK eye surgery was even possible, right? So now we can go in with these cool lasers and change the shape of your eye to improve your vision, a surgery that took minutes. And I walked out being able to see better than I had since I was a little child. An amazing innovation, right? These are people trying to push the envelope. They're trying to push the envelope in, in medical areas, right? And in, in creating new joints. You could have a hip replacement surgery nowadays and walk out of the hospital the same day. It is amazing to see. And it's not just in technology or healthcare. It's in our world of transportation as well. Connected and autonomous vehicles are all around us, and they're only getting to be more and more. More sensors, more smart technology that's helping us do things better, faster, at a lower cost than we were doing them before. These are innovations that are changing the world around us. They're also in the hard infrastructure that we deal with, right? Accelerated bridge construction. Awesome to watch in a new bridge get built and slid into place over the weekend. Amazing to see that happen. And not only are we able to build a bridge and slide it in over a weekend, but we have a complete 3D model of every component of that bridge and how it comes together and all the pieces and parts so we can understand and make a digital twin of the bridge and understand how it's performing, not just how it's built. Amazing innovations. When I first started as a young engineer and even an engineering technician years ago, the job when you're building roads was to collect tickets from all the construction workers or the, the truck drivers 
who showed up on the job, uh, like that lower left picture there, big stacks of tickets with every ton of asphalt or aggregate or concrete or whatever was being delivered on the road construction job, right? Those material tickets were the evidence that material was being delivered. We've really innovated past this now. We're moving to electronic ticketing in construction. Right now, these are digital means of understanding how much materials in the truck and digitally moving that evidence that material was delivered to the job site from place to place, rather than putting it all on paper. And if it was back in my day, sitting there with an adding machine running a tape to understand what the total quantity of materials was that were delivered on a particular day. How amazing to just sit with your phone and have that information in real time right in front of you. So innovations are happening all around us. And you might think, hey, what's in it for me? What are the benefits of being innovative? Well, I will tell you this. Being innovative is empowering. It shows that you're effective at doing your job. It shows that your team is an effective piece of the organization. It improves your brand value. As an innovative person, people are gonna to look to you as a leader. As an innovative organization, other organizations will want to work with you because they see the success you're having. You're gonna communicate that success. You're gonna have success. You're gonna have measurements that, that show how well you're doing. You're gonna recognize the leaders that are making that happen. That makes you innovative and people will then look to you as a leader. When you're innovative, life is more interesting, it's more satisfying, it's more engaging. If you're doing the same thing year after year for a 40 year career, you may only get one or two years experience 40 times over. But it's way much more exciting to have your career where you have 40 years of experience where you're continually improving, increasing your effectiveness and the things that you're working on. So it's valuable to take stock every now and then, to listen, to be open, to collaborate with others. And if you can reinvent yourself, like every five years or so, you're gonna have an exciting and a fulfilling career. You can be an innovator. With that, I thank you for uh, listening on the, this first part of the presentation. And I'm gonna turn it back to Jerry so he can lead us in the Q&A session. Well, thank you, Bill. That was uh, a most stimulating delivery and content. Thank you very much. Uh, you notice while we have Bill's slide up here, he's, uh, we'll get to a Q&A period momentarily, but he's been gracious enough to extend his email address and they'll entertain questions for a 24 hour period strictly germane to the topic today next slide please before we get to the q a i'd like to share with you uh, some of the upcoming webinars as we uh, embark on our fourth year of ara webinar wednesdays on uh february the 23rd uh, our colleague Jay Bledsoe will be uh, presenting Missouri's experience with high friction core surface treatments. And that'll be followed on March 30th by probabilistic deterioration modeling of concrete culverts presented by our colleague, Dr. Ahmad al -Hassan. Now you'll note, and I've mentioned this before because I've had the honor of serving as our moderator on the majority of these. We try to give you as an audience a mixture of topics related to capabilities that ARA has and our experience and knowledge and share that with you. So uh, we believe that we've accomplished that in the last three years and we're continuing to strive to do that. We've got presentations lined up currently through the summer of 2022. Next slide, please. So I'd like to get uh, Bill involved again, and you see his email address on this slide as well. Got a bit of time uh, that we'll cover some questions. I do have some questions. First of all, uh, a comment from uh, Cynthia Jones. Uh, great content. Please encourage attendees to become a friend or to participate directly 
with TRB's Committee on Research, Innovation, and Implementation. Those of you not familiar with the Transportation Research Board, it extends way beyond the word research. So if you work in operations or design or construction, you're missing out if you just focus on the word research. So, uh, Bill, the first question for you, this is from Andrew, and Andrew, uh, I'll paraphrase, works at an organization that, from his perspective, resists change. What are some of the things that he can do to help his organization become more innovative? Excellent, Andrew, that's, that's a, a wonderful question. You know, you can affect what you can affect, right? When at your level of the organization, you have the ability to have real input, real impact. You have the ability, we talked earlier about changing that mindset, right? About creating a culture of innovation. You may not be able to change an entire organization. And you may have an organization that resists change, but there are things that you can do with your team, with your colleagues, or maybe you've got some, some direct reports that work with you or a team that works with you. You can impact that smaller group. And if you take that smaller group and you help them to be innovative, to try new things, to show results, right? Make some measurements. Know what your performance is. Show that you can make improvements to that performance. And then communicate that success up the organization. All of a sudden, that resistance to change might be lessened a bit, right? That folks are going to say, oh, you're, yeah, you're doing things not exactly the way we used to do them, but, but wow, this is, this is way more effective the way you're doing it. So start where you are, start with what you can affect, but don't forget to communicate. Don't forget to measure how well you're doing to, you know, again, empower your team and the people that you work with, recognize their successes and communicate those. Communicate them to other parts of the organization. And what you'll find is that people will naturally see what you're doing at, as a leader, as an innovator. And that will allow you to have a bit of an impact on what you perceive then is that uh, organization that resists change. That's great, Bill. Thank you. So I have a uh, next question is from Katie and I'll paraphrase a bit to make it a brief, uh, a little briefer. Could you recommend some specific training that you believe DOT staff need to be successful innovators? Some of organizations lean uh, towards Six Sigma training programs, but it can be challenging to get, forgive me, broad participation in long training series. Oh, the, excellent, Jerry. Thank you. And Katie, thank you for the question. Uh, there, there are a number of training programs out there that, that will help you with, with some of the building blocks. Six Sigma is a, is a great program. Uh, it, it's something that, you know, obviously focuses very intently on the effectiveness and the efficiency of what you're doing. Training uh, specific to innovation can be a little bit tough, right? You notice that today's presentation was about concepts and it's about ideas. It's not about a step-by-step, -step. first you do this and then you do the next step and then you do the next step because the innovation is going to come in, in the daily work that you're doing and the subject of that work and the thing that you're trying to innovate on, you're trying to make better, faster, less costly, uh, it, those are different. So what we can affect is different. Um, I do recommend there are a number of, uh, of books that are available uh, that speak specifically to implementing innovation. The other thing I could point you to, especially in the transportation market, uh, is the, the Federal Highway Administration Center for Accelerating Innovation has really done a great job of creating a blueprint, if you will, through the, much of it through the Everyday Counts program of how to deploy innovation. And as people start looking at ways to deploy the new idea, you'll, you'll kind of naturally train yourself. You'll see the common steps that occur, many of them through those building blocks that I talked about earlier, right? Leadership, empowerment, communication, 
recognition and measurement. Uh, all of those pieces and parts come together, uh, and, and sometimes it's even best to learn through doing, right? So it, it's tough to just take a course and say, okay, when I'm done with this one-hour webinar, I'll be an innovator. And there are courses like that out there that will, will help you. But really what you need to do is, is dig your, your teeth into something that, uh, that will help you to do and to be more innovative. Uh, and, and that and deploy that innovation. And I think that's going to be your, your biggest path to success. Okay, thank you, Bill. And we've got about two more minutes for uh, questions. We'll try and get two of them in. Uh, Delaram asked a question. Uh, Bill, you spoke about e-ticketing as a new innovation, transportation construction. Where can we obtain additional information about e-ticketing? Oh, that's a, that's a wonderful question. It's, you know, I, if COVID did any positive for us, and, and you know, we've, we've been living through a lot of negatives, uh, living with the, the virus in our world for the last couple of years, uh, there has been a lot of acceleration in the world of e-ticketing. Most of it came about early on, right? This was a fledgling idea that, that accelerated quite a lot through COVID because we didn't want to pass pieces of paper around from loading it out at the plant to the truck driver to the person who's receiving it because we were worried that that paper might be covered with a virus that would cause folks to, to get sick and maybe lose some work time. So uh, the, the, I would say the best place to go to get information on e-ticketing right now uh, is the Federal Highway Administration. They have an initiative to deploy e-ticketing to help the states, to help the local governments deploy e-ticketing throughout the U.S. If you go, if you if just Google FHWA e-ticketing, or it, it's part of the Everyday Counts program, you know, EDC e-ticketing, those are a, a wealth of information there there's webinars that you can watch on the topic to understand the technologies, what works, what doesn't. I I'm also know that the, the concrete industry, the asphalt industry, the aggregate industry, all the folks who are delivering things to project sites are all very much engaged right now. Uh, it's, a, it's a young market, but it is a very much growing market. So I would recommend that you start with the FHWA e-ticketing initiative and from there, it's going to take you out to, to get a wealth of additional information. Well, that's great, Bill. Um, unfortunately, we're all out of time for questions. We've got a few more in our queue, and we'll get to those. Uh, Bill will be, uh, I'll be sharing that with Bill. And I'll get back to everyone uh, accordingly. Uh, just to comment uh, before we go on here, two more slides. Chris was so impressed with the content, Bill, that he left early to go and innovate something because he's all fired up. So uh, I thought that was uh, quite terrific. So just uh, two more slides. I want to thank everybody again for joining and thank Bill. Uh, all the webinar participants joining for the full hour and you have to be joining for the full hour. And I, I think we'll give Chris credit for that since he left for a good thing. We'll receive PDH certificate and a PDF copy of today's presentation. And please allow us about two weeks before you receive your certificate. If you uh, are interested in registering uh, uh, or you have any questions concerning, uh, concerning ARA's webinar program, there's an email address here that you can contact us. Also, I was remiss as I introduced the up and coming webinars that that is the location where we have recordings of all the previous webinars as well as information on registering. And then finally, the last slide, please. So ARA is a great company. We're approximately 1,600 strong, about high 40s offices across the US. Uh, we strive to hire uh, value colleagues, not only based on their skills and their knowledge, but also demonstrate the core corporate values of passion, freedom, service, and growth. Uh, we have a number of exciting opportunities currently and, and plan for the future. And if you're interested in employment opportunities with ARA's transportation and infrastructure offices, that's one of our six business sectors, one of six, please send a brief resume and your contact information to the address that you see on slide 53. I want to thank you all for joining today's program again. Thank Bill. May God bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you next month, February 23rd.